This is Words Aptly Spoken, which comes from Proverbs 25:11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The written word is a precious treasure. We want to preserve written knowledge for God's glory and as an anchor to the history of the church and its classical conversations. We hope to encourage the reading of words and of the word. Well, good evening, everyone. It is um, Thursday, March 30th, if I think I'm in the right month. This is throwing me off having five Thursdays. So tonight we are going to discuss teaching writing structure and style. And Andrew Poudois will be joining us shortly. He's the author of that book. And then next week, we'll be back to discuss the book Number of the Stars by Lois Lowry, which is an amazing story of how Denmark's citizens rescued their Jewish population during World War II. So I'm very excited about that. So while we wait for Andrew, I will tell you guys a story, and then I want you to respond with your own metaphor. So I was teaching a writing workshop, which had classical conversations, parents, and challenge students in it. And I said, before we start, I would like everyone to take a few minutes and come up with a metaphor to tell me how you feel about writing academic assignments. And I gave them a few minutes and this young man who was sitting right in front of me, as soon as I called on them, his hand shot up and I happened to have known him since birth. So I had a good feeling of what might be coming. <laughs> and Mason says, writing is like being in a deep, dark hole and trying to claw your way out with no tools and no fingernails. <laughs> so... I took that to mean that he did not love writing that is horrible. the academic essay. So <laughs> does anyone else have fears about writing while we let Andrew, are you really in Andrew? Can you hear us? He is here. He Mr. is really himself. here. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear yes. you. So can I? I'm at the Greenville Convention Center. Oh, I thought you would be there yes yeah. are you at ghc mm -hmm. yes so i am sorry um oh, <laughs> i was <okay>. talking <laughs> no worries i i'm gonna repeat okay. the story i just told our audience so that you can respond to it so i okay uh, great I asked um, an audience of parents and students to make give me a metaphor for how they felt about writing academic assignments. And a 12 year old boy in the audience said that writing for him was like being at the bottom of a deep, dark hole and having to claw his way out with no tools and no fingernails. And I knew you would appreciate that. So <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's priceless. Oh, that's <laughs> priceless and the irony of it he came up with it so easily i know it, it was a beautiful piece of yeah, writing in yeah. itself wasn't it <laughs> it was yeah it was so on that note because i know you're going to make us all feel equipped to write tonight but do you want to tell us first about your family and let everyone catch up on how your family's doing um sure well let's see my Seven grown children have brought me 15 grandchildren, actually five of them. And my son is getting married in November. He's the last of the kids to get married. And we are, um, we are really enjoying the freedom of being able to have grandkids come for a while and then go home. Uh, and have them close by so that I get a relationship. I would say the most interesting thing about getting old is grandchildren, because you can observe them differently. You can not worry about the same things or different things. And my whole purpose, really, I feel like in life, not whole, but huge purpose in life is just to bring joy, joy to grandchildren. And I did not anticipate this, you know, 10 years ago. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. I'm eating scientifically and exercising a lot and actually feeling happier, healthier, stronger, and more alive than I have for 40 years. 
So That's good news. I have no complaints. It's almost like make make you nervous. Things are going too good. Mm. There's got to be a disaster right around the corner. <laughs> You're tempting fate. Well, so um, tell everyone in the audience where you are in case we had a few people join us late. So. Okay. Yep. I am at the Greenville South Carolina Convention Center. Um, where I um, spoke earlier today, and uh, it seems to be very busy here. I think we are getting a, a lot, uh, a lot of people, and I think there's way more vendors than there was last year. So that's a good sign. And of course, you know, a constant flow of CC moms wanting to take pictures with my bearded <laughs> self. Yes. <sighs> so I must say that. Um... I don't think Heather Lee is here, but um, Heather Lee may have sent me a picture today of a custom made Pez dispenser featuring the head of Andrew Poudois. So <laughs> I think that might be my favorite fangirl moment for you. Oh, gosh. The other one that was pretty rough was someone um, had had some custom made socks with my face decorating <laughs> the socks. And I just thought, no, why, why such an idea could possibly happen? <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's kind of fun. Well, I was at a talk the other day where someone had done the same with Lee's face. So you guys are, you have, you have your crew. So, well, I'm going to ask one more preparatory question. Then I promise we're getting to TWSS, which is why we're here. But we, this is a book club about fiction reading. And I know you're a reader. So we're curious to know what you're reading right now. Oh, okay. Gosh, I love talking about that. So um, I um, recently finished a biography of Catherine of Siena by Sigurd Unset. Yes. And I was so impressed with this book. It was well written. It brought me right into 1300s Italy and the horrors of life and the amazingness of this woman and how Jesus talked to her and the thousands and tens of thousands of converts because of her. This is an amazing story. But I got so interested in that and I thought, wow, I really like the writing. And then I always knew that everybody has to read Kristen Lavin's daughter before they die. And I'd been procrastinating really a long time. And I thought, okay, I, I can do it now. And uh, so I'm a few chapters in and it's a big, big, big thing. Um, but I am very much enjoying Kristen Lavin's daughter. And um, so we'll, we'll see if I get all the way to the end of it. I think it's many, many hours ahead <laughs> so yes, uh and then uh nonfiction. i just uh i i have mentioned in conference talks recently a book called um the rise and triumph of the modern self by carl mm -hmm. truman and it kind of uh traces the rise of therapeutic psychology as becoming essentially the new religion and the effect of that on uh, everyone's thinking, going all the way back to the Romantic poets and then through Nietzsche and Freud and Marx and, um, and, and how all of that is formed where we are today. It's a really extremely well done philosophy synopsis of how we got to where we are. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. So I read it once, but I was questioning whether I remembered certain things correctly as I was telling it to people. So I went to read it again and double check and I was telling it pretty much correctly, but I uh, picked up more along the way. So that's what I've been reading. All right. Well, I love Kristen Laverne's daughter. So you'll have to, we'll have to schedule a meal in Tulsa to discuss it when you finish it. Yeah. Are you going to be at the thing in North Carolina? And when is that? May? I'm not this year. The CC thing? That'd no, be a good okay. deadline for you. You could, can you finish it by then? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially if you'll fly out and talk about it. Okay. Well, keep me posted. If you finish it, maybe I'll change my, my plans and come out. <laughs> good. 
Well, um, I do want to just quickly remind everyone that our book club tonight is sponsored by classicalconversationsbooks.com. And you can buy any of the resources that we talk about there, including teaching, writing, structure, and style, which everyone will want to have for essentials. Um, and that our entire book club schedule for the year, including links to the bookstore, can be found on leebortons.com. And with that, um, I'm, I'm hoping you guys are going to have some questions for Andrew while you're thinking and putting those in the chat for Julie. Um, I'm going to, I would like to read the dedication to teaching, writing, structure, and style, Andrew, because I think it may, um, it's short. And I think it may tell us why you wanted to do this thing and have been doing it so long. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to quote okay. you to you. <laughs> This seminar workbook is dedicated to all the students who, having been given a creative writing assignment, were lost in space, staring at the blank piece of paper entitled My Summer Vacation or some such thing. It is dedicated to all the students who, unbeknownst to themselves, may arrive in a university class having never been taught how to structure a paragraph, organize an essay, or even compose sentences that make sense. Most significantly, however, it is dedicated to all the parents and teachers of today's students who know the importance of written and oral communication and have determined to give their students these vital skills. The pen indeed is mightier than the sword, for it is in the written word that we do most powerfully preserve that which is noble and expose that which is evil. And so in great part, the very future of society rests with those who can write and write well. So how do you feel about your, your preface? Wow. That's um, actually a, that's a pretty strong experience because I don't think I have read that for a very long time. And the fact that I wrote it, gosh, pushing 27 years now, um, that's pretty remarkable to me. Um, I didn't think I could write that good. <laughs> um, but I think it is the, the essence of, I, I don't know, there were, there were a lot of conger, converging factors that caused me to do the very first teaching, writing, structure, and style seminar. One of them was just purely economic. I was just looking for a way to make a little money on the side. Another was I had this dedication to Webster and I, I knew he's going to time out and I wanted to keep his work alive because he was a big mentor for me. And the third one was that some aspect of God working in my life to say, this is what you really should do. And it was kind of a scary thought um, for a while, but God is so faithful. And I just, you know, started teaching seminar after seminar and pretty soon made some videotapes of the seminar and then pretty soon made some student tapes and pretty soon made some lesson plan books and, and pretty soon it was like this whole thing that, that had a potential so far, far beyond what I could have ever imagined. So it, you know, I always tell everybody who comes to work for us, look, this is God's business. I, and hopefully you, we just try not to screw things up. You know, that's, it's God's business. So I don't know, is that the answer? Yeah. No, is that I, the kind of answer you're looking for? I think that's great. I loved hearing the history of it. So um, for those people who don't know, let's talk about the title. So what's the structure part of it? And what's the style part of it? Uh, yeah, okay. So um, Dr. Webster used these terms. So I learned them from him in this context. And structure are the models, the ways to organize compositions. So uh, when we look at our unit, we have unit one and two, which is basic keyword outline note taking. Then unit three, which is the... Um, Story sequence chart. That's a three paragraph structure. And then unit four, we introduce the topic clincher paragraph model. And unit five, we have the writing from pictures also continuing. And, and then unit six with the research process, unit seven 
and eight with the introductory conclusion uh, moving to the the rhetoric model and then um, the critique which is kind of a replacement for the book report so these are the structures and um, the style are the ways that you say things so when you add in your vocabulary ly adverb strong verb quality adjective um, you're, you're changing, playing with the tone, the style of the writing. When you add in phrases and clauses, participles, varying sentence length, getting up into the decorations with some of the schemes and tropes that they will learn in rhetoric later, uh, those decorations. And so that's the style. And um, I would not have known this at the time that I learned these words in this context because uh, Dr. Webster's original book was called Blended Structure and Style in Composition. And so that's where it all came from. But um, later on, I learned about uh, the canons of rhetoric being invention, arrangement, and elocution. And of course, the arrangement is structure and the elocution is style. So, you know, we fit very well into that model. And then invention being a process that we uh, introduce uh, as we move through the structural models, the how to think of stuff. And um, so that's where the structure and style comes from and, and the balance of it um, <clears throat> seems to be very successful. I mean, we've had many, many thousands of kids, I'm sure, uh, you know, head off into college or real world or challenge levels or, anything um being very well prepared for the next the next type of instruction they might encounter that's great so i have to ask you i'm going to put you on the spot do you have a favorite unit um yes i do um but i i come to appreciate the ones that i didn't always appreciate as much but my favorite unit is unit six, because I think it is a perfect demonstration of how we need to be able to create simple out of complex. So when we have too much information, we have to make choices about what information to use. And that making of choices is a process of discernment that I think is so valuable to the intellectual development of the student. Mm -hmm. And in unit six, we have the multiple sources. So, you know, um, hopefully it's at or below the reading level, but they have to read through what's important. Okay, that makes the cut, it goes into the outline. Do that with another source. It's gonna be different, different way of putting, or maybe additional different information. Well, does that make the cut? Maybe another source. So you get the three sources. Then the student has to say, okay, of all the possibilities here, what's the best of the best? What fits together the most? What's gonna be the most interesting combination? And that thinking process, I, I just really value that a lot. And then, you know, from a more practical point of view, it's just so much more reasonable than the, the carpet of note cards that, you know, many of us experienced when we were younger and had to do the term paper. So I, t I, love, I love it when we have complicated things and we can present them to students in a simpler um, step by step way. Yeah, I think that's good. I would I think that unit has been the most helpful to my children. So um, I have a daughter who is a very precise personality, and she wanted to include every fact that was in a library book once about Rosa Parks. And I kept saying, "So that author <laughs> already did that. <laughs> I need I need you not to repeat what they did." Um, but still today, I think she falls back on these skills. She's now a senior and reading, you know, much larger texts. Mm -hmm. And I think she's finding that skill still of picking out the most important things still, still good. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. No, um, I was just going to say uh, to Lynn, who asked the question, and I like question. Since having grandchildren, have we revised the writing instruction at all? Um, 
I think the only thing that would have changed is maybe just my personal style. And one of the things that I have discovered is that I am less stressed by teaching other people's children than my own. And so the most recent round of teaching I did, I didn't have any of my own kids and I didn't have any grandchildren. It was all anonymous kids that just fell in love with them all. And we had, um, you know, a really good time making the videos and all that. Um, but I, I'm really looking to teaching my grandchildren because now I think I can combine the best of the teacher me, the, the relative me, the, the authority me, and then the experienced um, relaxed me. I think I can get like an ideal combination of me um, for this next wave of kids I'm going to start teaching. My oldest grandson who lives in Oklahoma is 10, and he's just really now reading and writing easily. And his little sister is eight, and she pretty much reads and writes up at his level and they've got cousins and friends and we have this little community and I'm going to start teaching one day a week um, writing and Latin. Um, again, I get to do, I taught Latin for six years and then I quit for a long time and it's hard to, it's hard to retain it, but I'm going to start all over back again with uh, first year Latin with a bunch of little kids and um, go a second round. So. I think if I survive that one, then maybe my writing instruction would change. But our company is now not me. We have just so many, so many talented contributors in every way. And we have collaboration and we have leadership. Um, we have um, kind of organized everything the way we want it. And now it's just bringing some of those older products into um, conformity or replacing them with new products. And so I think our consistency level now is going to be a lot better than some of you suffered about 10 years ago when our, uh, our theme-based books kept changing every other year. It was awfully frustrating to everyone, and I do apologize. But let's see. Timothy, my almost 15 year old is using her TWSS skills to create her 12 page research paper on baking bread. These outlines have been huge. Love to hear it. I, uh, I, I love it when the kids make that leap into, okay, I did this in microcosm a few times. Now I know how to apply this to a much bigger task. And again, that's part of, you know, making something simple so that it can be learned well, so that it can be um, elaborated on and expanded. Okay, so I have to tell you a story, Andrew. I don't know if you'll remember this. My son, Ben, is almost 24, and he came up to you at the Oklahoma Homeschool Convention because he wanted to read you his writing from pictures, which he had just finished. And it was a picture of the man that gets thrown into the lion's den. And his first sentence after that happened was, Thankfully, the man spoke a little lion. <laughs> so. I love it. I love it. Yeah, you know, unit five is probably the one we get the most questions about. Um, people, they, 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 they feel like somehow they have to be sure that the kids are making sense and that everything it fits the world of logic and that, that the, the adults are very attached to that. And over the years of teaching unit five, I have come to realize it's far better to just relax, demand that kind of thing in, you know, the, the academic side, units four, six, eight. But when you're in unit five, let them play and experiment and come up with crazy ideas. I mean, think of all the crazy ideas that became really big and successful. And you think like, who in the world would have ever imagined that a, you know, a talking tomato and a cucumber singing about a hairbrush could become a thing, right? Like that had to come from the mind of someone. And um, I don't want to, I don't want to stifle that kind of wild imagination. So when it comes to unit five, I love it 
when people just like immediately break the paradigm. They just immediately say, well, I'm going to do something totally different than what the person drawing these pictures would have thought. And, and then they run with that and fly with that. So, um, you know, that unit five, if there's ever a place to follow Webster's edict, hands on structure and style, hands off content, it's unit five, just let it go and laugh your way home. And it's all going to go in the trash anyway, eventually. So don't, don't get attached. Let's see, Jessica wrote something here. This is our first year of essentials with my oldest, but I remember meeting with Sabuta on a homeschool writing class in Fairbanks, Alaska, probably in 1998. Yes, wow, Jessica, how fun. That is a delight to, to hear. I remember him stressing how important it would be for children to start learning typing in addition to handwriting. Apparently that was my biggest takeaway. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm actually going back to Anchorage um, in, in April, yeah, in this next month. And uh, I had a lot of opportunity, taught, met a lot of kids in, in Alaska. One of the most interesting things about teaching in Alaska was in the village, because the children in the Alaskan village did not have a, a fluency with English. And they didn't really have a fluency with a native language the way, say, their parents and grandparents did. So their their speaking is is very, very hard. It's choppy. It's not. They don't naturally use English the way you or I would think a native speaker would. And I was working with them, this. And then when they started writing. I was amazed at their ability to write more complete sentences and articulate things in, in a longer sequence of words than they ever could have spoken. It was the first time I had met, ever met a, a whole group of children, most of whom could write more easily than they could speak or more, more sophisticated than they could speak. And uh, so I, I found that really interesting. They they had learned the language from the literature. They had learned the language from reading, um, not primarily by hearing it. And so they were able to translate their reading database into their writing database, but it bypassed to some degree their speaking database. I, I just found it so fascinating. Yeah, that is fascinating. I um. I may be having a similar experience and that I'm helping adapt our grammar essentials curriculum into different languages. So I like to joke that I could not go down to Brazil and order a meal, but I can diagram a sentence. I don't know how useful that's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I, on that note, I've been working, as you know, with some of our communities around the world. And um, I had a question from some of our Spanish speaking users of IEW. Um, uh -oh. And I answered them, but I want to, I guess, see how well I did. So I'm going to let you answer <laughs> then, I'll, then I'll compare. But one of the things she said was, okay. well, whenever I'm teaching these dress ups, the kids aren't doing it well. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? And she said, well, sometimes they use an adverb that doesn't really go with that verb or they, or we wouldn't um, express ourselves this way in Spanish. So what, what would you say to her about those dress ups, the style part of it? Yeah. I would say that even kids who are native speakers of English will use stylistic techniques awkwardly. And that's kind of normal for learning to do it. So if you make the comparison to say playing a musical instrument, um, you know, there's this awkwardness and then it gets easier and then there's a new harder technique and there's an awkwardness and then it gets easier and more natural and then there's a new harder technique. And so every time there's something added, there's a period of awkwardness and that is just normal for learning the skill, whatever it is. In this case, we are um, 
we we find that awkwardness a little hard because our mind immediately judges it against a a more perfected version and so again this is why kind of the you know give it as much leeway as you can and don't worry about the product because it's in the the making of the choice that learning is happening and you can positively influence the choices too um you know if there's a word that's really just not a good one um don't ever say something like well this kind of does work can't you think of a better word because the kid is like, if I could have thought of a better word, I would have thought of a better word. So right. just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Um, so that idea of, of giving suggestions along the way, and, you know, a lot of teachers and parents around the world think that somehow kids are only learning if they're doing it all on their own. I don't know why this is particular to writing, but it's kind of like, well, if I help them, then they won't be learning. Well, the opposite is true, as we well know. It's by helping them that they learn. It's by doing it together that they gain confidence to, to try it independently. So uh, I think, you know, just doing everything together and um, not being attached to the product, just attend to the process and keep modeling good language. And then, you know, they'll grow up and the awkwardness will, will dissipate. So that's that would be kind of my mini lecture. Yeah. What you told them? Um, it's very close to what I told them. I also shared with them a story about a student of mine that I had one year who just got very excited about alliteration. And um, she gave me a, one of the three paragraph units that was about 80% alliterated. <laughs> and I just I remember thinking, so she really likes this and she really gave herself a lot of practice and over yeah. time i think she will probably not alliterate so often um but but it's you know that's typical I, it, of yeah. childhood you repeat the I thing think you're in excited. The, yeah i think in the in the gwss video i actually use the analogy that these decorations these style techniques they become like new toys and children want to play with the toy and play with the toy and experiment with it and sometimes break it and sometimes put it back together. And then, you know, at a certain point, they they aren't so obsessed with the new toy and there's another new toy. And, and eventually you have a nice little shelf of, of toys or tools to work with. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm curious about you guys having any conversation on the chat GPT phenomenon and how that may or may not affect our students, especially our older ones. Yeah, we well, have been having some. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Julie, you go first. I was going to say, I was um, at Church of All Places a couple weeks ago and wrote an entire um, five um, paragraph essay on how to classically educate your children, like right there in one minute, it was a little bit scary. And I, and we started talking about, you know, just how artificial intelligence is not intelligent, you know, cause it still needs the brain. It still needed my words to, you know, scour the internet for all of the things there is about classical education. So it, it just, hopped in my brain a couple of weeks ago and it was fascinating. And I said, this needs to stay out of the hands of every student in America, in the world, because this will, this is worse than Sparks notes. I mean, it's worse. Oh, by magnitude. <laughs> yes. Here, here's a, here's an, I, I, here's an idea that I just heard and I had never thought of this, but um, the chat GPT, when we, take something that it says and bring it and use it in some form, it is actually affecting our thinking more than if we were just reading something that someone wrote. And so uh, you could take some chat GPT and then you could, you know, doctor it up, throw in your dress ups, your topic clincher. You wouldn't have to do any heavy lifting, just a little style polishing. And then you could turn it in. And, um, you know, I, I don't have a comment on 
the ethics of that. But what I would think is that as you are reading and using it, the the whatever subtle bias in in word usages and thoughts that you know are behind the language that's coming to you that's going to affect the way that you think about the thing that you're writing about even that you're not even writing about I, it's scary as heck to me yeah we talk we spend a lot of time talking about um wanting education to make our kids free and to me, that's another place where they could so easily lose their freedom, because if you if you're not careful, you lose your voice and you lose your ability to think and then automatically you have become less free. Yeah, you start using yeah. their words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. So I think did Lynn, did you have a question? Yeah, you unmute? Lynn, explain your question a little bit. Well, when when you first read that um, that prologue, and it ended with something about writing being the tool to do something beautiful and expose evil, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, well, sure, I can write and tell people about something evil, but I kept thinking about it, thinking today we don't even need to tell anybody about evil. It, people now just write evilly about everything and everybody. Uh, we see it on social media. We see it in kids' chat rooms. Um, we see it with TikTok trying to make people do things to others that are so unkind and so terrible. And I just, I never thought about we would expose our own evil by our own writing. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's how you meant it anyways. And I just misunderstood it. Uh, I see your double, it's it's a double meaning there, isn't it? Because yes, you can expose your own evil by writing. And by writing, you can expose other evils. Mm -hmm. Wow, interesting. So I was just wondering if, if that's how you well, meant it doubly or, um, or maybe now it's our writing because we don't have the good modeling, the modeling good language that you just talked about. So many students don't have that anymore because they're they're in front of a screen and so much of it is done AI or um, you know chat rooms. And so the modeling of good writing that you've given us in Twist is, is such a rare experience today. Yes. It is very different than what most kids are getting, but they take to it quite well. You know, even kids that come out of the worst public schools and pop into, you know, essentials and they, you know, they take to it or they get one of our videos. And so I think, well, we know, we know that children naturally love order. And when we can present anything in an orderly way, it, reaches their heart and you know in a deeper way than just just their intellect and so i kind of look at the structure and style approach as bringing this deeper level of order to language than most people bump into now it's it's not it's not comprehensive it's not even complete but it's more than most people are getting uh, in today's world, as you said. Um, you know, a frightening statistic is fewer than one third of high school students read a book in the last year. Wow. So, you, you know, you compare that with, you know, when you were in high school or when I was in high school or heaven forbid when our parents were in high school, um, the, the level of of actual interfacing with objective ideas through the text is almost non-existent for almost everyone. In fact, I have a friend, um, we may hire him. He um, it was kind of funny. He was coming in our office to kind of have an initial get to know each other talk. He'd been teaching ninth grade social studies in Broken Arrow for 12 years. And, you know, he was, I love my job. I, I love teaching. And, you know, he's said that several times. So I finally said, 
I'm just curious if you love your job and you love teaching, why are you considering a different job? Fair enough, right? Is, and then I said, is it because of the woke agenda? Is it because they're pushing this, you know, CRT and DEI and LBD and all that on you? Um, is that what's got you here? And he said, no, that's actually not the problem. We don't have that. It's a conservative district. Nothing's coming from the top down. There's a few, you know, rainbow flags, but it, that's not it. The thing that's killing me is these kids just don't want to learn. Nobody wants to learn. They either can't read or won't read. They either can't write or won't write. They, I give them answers to questions they won't even try to study or remember the answers. And what's even worse is that any kid who shows an interest in learning is just smashed by the, by the majority. And nobody is really wanting to learn anything anymore. It was, I, I was almost crying by the end of his narrative because it sounded just so tragic. And, you know, there he is. He's in probably one of the best school districts and one of the most conservative, non-political places. And that's his problem. How, how do you keep teaching in that world? How, how do you be a student in that world? You know, that's why I, I keep feeling like we need to recruit more people out of the system. I don't care where yeah. they go, but we need we need to save more kids. Mm, well, that's a good word. That reminds me of an, of an experience I had. I'm teaching um, Challenge 3 this year. So my students are 16 to 18. And we're writing these acrostic poems. And one of my students wrote an acrostic poem and, and it was a very descriptive poem. And it sound, he was basically describing the space that is a beautiful medieval library. And I just looked at them and I said, I feel like you just described yourselves because you are officially now the keepers of the book. Mm -hmm. And um, you're, you are excited to come in here every week. You, mm -hmm. you spur each other on to read these books and have these great discussions. And I don't think you can see at your age and level of experience how very rare and precious this is, this gift that you've been to each other and to me. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. It's, it, it's oh. great to end on this, um, this comment. So we had a student walk into. He wants to wave and say hi. He wants to wave and say hi, but oh. he's 14 and is I'll tell, him, I'll tell him my newest favorite joke. Okay. Andrew's <laughs> going to tell you a joke, buddy. Are you ready? All right, here we go. What's your name? Oh, what's his name? Uh, we don't know his I, name. I think my name's, my name's Isaac. Isaac. Okay. Hi, Isaac. Uh, okay. So I think you'll get this joke. Uh, you probably heard that the nations of Finland, Sweden, and Norway have started to paint large barcodes on the side of their ships. Do you know why? No. Well, no. <laughs> oh, you don't know why. That's so that when the ships return to port, they can all scan the Navy in. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> Love it. That's funny. All right, here's one more. Here's one more. Monday, no, no. Sunday, Greg, Monday, Ian. Tuesday, Greg, Wednesday, Thursday, Greg, Friday, Ian, Saturday, Gregorian. This is the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> oh. That's funny. oh gosh those are great dad, dad jokes great way yeah. for us. <laughs> yes a great way for us to end well andrew thanks for Thank you, andrew. fitting andrew. us in well sure it's a pleasure i'm sorry it was a few minutes late um but uh that's the convention world here for you and thank you all for your comments and uh positive things keep up the good work inspiring and uh recruiting people into our world mm -hmm. great thanks andrew thanks andrew mm -hmm. see bye, you guys, guys next week all right bye adios bye. thank you thank you